Michael. You do it. Hey, everybody. My name is Dave. Hey. Guess, is, guess who I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we run a studio called Dave and Gabe. Uh, we're super pumped to be here. Uh, being in Berlin last year was super sick, and it was really cool to see a bunch of you from Berlin here as well. So we're pumped to give you some updates on what we've been doing. Uh, so we should just dive right in. Yeah, totally. Uh, so we have a studio in Brooklyn, New York, um, where we build large-scale interactive projects, usually featuring music and sound, uh, and then also like a very likely a visual component as well. Um, yeah, we've been doing stuff for about five years now. That's right. Both of our backgrounds are pretty heavy sound backgrounds. Um, so a lot of our projects revolve around music, uh, but we also do a lot of physical design, physical build, uh, and a lot of lighting work as well to support those projects. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about our studio, because I think it'll help ground you guys about where we're coming from with some of these jobs. Um, three years ago, we took over this big warehouse in Bushwick in Brooklyn. Uh, and we renovated the whole thing. Uh, we went in on it with a bunch of other people that we know, a couple of fabrication shops and some other design friends. Uh, here's some imagery of us doing some of the demo. This was a mess. Very this is qualified. what our current studio is. Uh, it looked like a war zone for a little while. Um, it was a couple of months of this, then it started getting a little bit nicer, and then a little bit nicer as well. Uh, here's a little bit of a before and after of one part of our studio. Um, and then we'll take you on just like a little bit of a tour. So these are the plans. Um, we share the upstairs studio space uh, with Future Wife LLC. You might know Bo Burrows. He does a lot of really beautiful touch work. He's crazy. He's insane. It uh, sucks to share a space with him because you wake up and you're like, I woke up before 10. And then you get there and he's like, I fucking just made a new driver to do this insane thing. And he's <laughs> like, I'm going to go back to bed and not do anything. Yeah. Yeah, if, you, if you're not following uh, Future Wife LSC, you should He's take insane. a look. He's yeah. great. Um, we also share the space with Yotam Mann, who does a lot of um, web audio programming and a lot of um, L ML uh, audio work. Uh, Sarah Rothberg is a VR artist who's really sick, and Neil Klein is like a, a WebGL kind of guy, visuals. Um, this, I just wanted to show you what our studio looks like. Yeah, so this is our upstairs area, um, and there was a pigeon one day, and that's me trying to get the pigeon out of the space. Um, there it is. But uh, there's also 40 channels of sound. This is where we prototype a lot of our multi-channel and immersive audio projects. That's um, right. So if you look close here, you can see that there's uh, 16 channels of audio around ear height, 23 channels in the ceiling, and then we have a sub stack. Uh, so we do a lot of multi-channel 3D audio work. This is where we do all the prototyping for it. Um, it's super nice to have a permanent system. I think a lot of what we struggled with for years is that we'd do a really cool project with maybe 24 or 30 channels and we'd have like a day and a half to actually work with it and poke it and push on it and figure out what really sounds good. So it's really nice to have a space where we have a permanent system. Yeah, like previs for immersive audio kind of isn't really a thing. So like you sort of just, you need something to really feel the sound moving around you. Uh, in addition to working in our space, we also host a series of concerts uh, and all kinds of events all around the building. So upstairs we do uh, a, a concert series called Spatialized, where we invite people in to create pieces for the 40-channel audio system. We do a couple of sessions with the artist, and then uh, we invite the public. We do like a ticketed event, like 100 seats. Some people come and hang out. Um, we also taught a course last semester at ITP called Sound and Space, where the final was all the students needed to make a piece for the 40 channel audio system, and then we had a concert with them. Uh, and then we also just host, host shows. This is Magisphere recently. If you're Berlin-based, you might know them. Really cool synth stuff. Uh, we recently did a show with Sontag Shogun as well, who's part, partially Montreal-based, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that just goes along with this idea that you know, we're collaborating with musicians a lot, and especially when it comes with something like a new speaker setup, we want the music itself to take advantage of that system. Um, so if a musician just comes in and they only have a day or a sound check to really f like flex on this thing, it doesn't really work. So we want to actually build like a vocabulary of here's how your music can work in 3D. So by hosting these concerts, the audience gets to know like kind of what they like about 3D sound, and the artists get to know what they like about it too. 
so moving on, we also share this space with two fabrication uh, studios. So we've got a real big shop in the space that we all have access to. Uh, we've been working with these guys for years. I should just go back and mention them. Their Gamma NYC is the one. They're like a digital fabrication shop. And Young Buck is the other one. They're a little bit more traditional fabrication, woodwork, metalwork. Um, but this really enables some of the more physical work that we do, uh, having these facilities directly in the building that we're in. Um, we have this big main space that we all share. And this is specifically for making new work. So I think we've probably all been a part of projects where you're trying to get it together. You don't have a place to actually build it, so you build it for the first time on site and then nothing works at all, uh, both physically and like cabling and everything else. So this is kind of our answer to that where we, we do everything before it goes out. And that also talks a little bit to like being able to push and pull on the projects that we're building. Again, like if we can build something in full a week before it goes out, then we can really figure out what it's good at instead of like having a few hours to do that. Uh, we have a commercial kitchen that we recently renovated, which is really sick for friends who do food work, uh, like food art stuff, which is cool. And then similarly to upstairs, we do events in the big main space too. So we hosted a, a Detroit techno night a couple of years ago with Carl Craig and Moody Man. So that's the same space uh, with 500 people in it. Uh, we did this pretty cool event with Cool 3D World. I don't know if you all know who Cool 3D World is. Yeah, they're like a surrealist freak out animation studio that like posts stuff on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you should definitely follow them uh, to get a dose of weird in your life. But yeah, we made this like Halloween experience called Ghoul 3D World. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and uh, there was people dressed up like mole rats that would massage you. And uh, I don't know, it was, it was very bizarre. Uh, very hard to classify event, yeah. I would say. <laughs> um, and then uh, we did a record release show with Sun O. Oh, I don't know if you all know who they are, but they're like a really famous sludge metal band. Uh, the kind of stuff where they just like ring out a guitar chord super crazy loud for like 20 minutes at a time. Uh, and we built these massive speaker towers in our space in response to having them wanting to do this in our spot. Um, absolutely huge, tons of power. And then we fogged the hell out of the place. Um, something really yeah. cool about having your own kind of event space is you can do whatever you want. So a lot of venues, I'm sure you guys know, don't like fog and haze, but we love fog and haze. So we fogged it all up and then we backlit the stacks and then we just, we played the record at somewhere around like 115 dB. We gave everybody earplugs. Yeah, that didn't help that much. <laughs> you felt it, it very much felt yeah. like a, a scrub for your brain. Uh, and this is a photo from, from the show. You can kind of make out the chairs a little bit. <laughs> yeah. OK. Uh, and then um, the last space uh, we wanted to mention was uh, Super AOK, which is a photo studio, uh, kind of like a product shop. They make uh, a product called the A1 Array, which is kind of one of these like, um, like. It's like a matrix style bullet time yeah. camera, where it's like an array of cameras, and they all snap at once, and then they like, can like, move around across them. But they have this psych wall in their space. Um, and similar to the, all the other spots in our uh, studio, we started to want to do shows here as well. Um, so I think that's the first thing we're really going to get into in terms of projects. Yeah, uh, last summer we uh, got to help out with a One Hundred Six Point Never tour um, called Myriad. Uh, there was a guy named Nate Boyce, who's a close uh, buddies of Dan's, and uh, Nate hit us up. We helped like do some of the programming for the visual systems. And uh, we got to meet the band and hang out. And uh, there was a girl who had gotten brought on for the band named Kelly Moran. Uh, and she was coming out with her own record and had just gotten signed to Warp. Um, so she came by to the studio and she saw that we have a piano there. And she was like, hey, I'm looking for a place to do my record release. And we were like, whoa, that would be cool. Um, we should do it in Super AOK's space because they have this really cool, like swoopy, uh, seamless psych wall. And we could put the piano right in the middle of it, and then we'll do some cool stuff and projection map the whole thing and do like a live visual uh, experience for all of your songs. So uh, we dove in. We started to make like a whole set of visuals to go along with each of our, the new songs on a record. And then as you can see, the audience sat around the uh, perimeter of the wall as the visuals were sort of raining down onto them. Yeah, so this was, again, like the, like like our studio having um, concerts there, it's like a very intimate setting. It's somewhere around 100, 150 people. Um, and it was sick. So we'll yeah, show you. Yeah, it was super cool. Um, 
I can show you a little bit about the session, actually, that we use to do it. Uh, let, me, let me jump out of this for a hot sec. Um, so yeah, it was great. We, uh, we had sort of like a little bit of previs in the, in the session, um, imported the, the piano 3D model. Um, we're doing some uh, like warping on a piece of geometry that Dave was able to export. So uh, it's like, you know, we've got the curve of the psych wall here, and then it's textured, and we're looking at it with a camera um, that's in the same position as the projector is. So we can sort of like get that distortion figured out. Um, and then the actual graphics itself um, was great. It was, uh, we got to use Zerr. I don't know if y'all have had a chance to mess around with it. Um, it's made by the 404.0 folks. And uh, it was totally a lifesaver for this kind of stuff where you, bas you basically get these um, preset knobs um, that are sort of like sweeping between the parameters that you have that control your session. Um, and then sort of by by messing around with them, uh, you get to like blend between these different uh, layers. So that let me sort of queue up all these different effects that we wanted to play with, and then um, perform it live with Kelly during the show. Um, yeah, so there was like nine different looks, um, and each look sort of would have a different set of, uh, of like parameters for each one. Um, it was like it was definitely a, a challenge in a way to like. Uh, build all of this in the amount of time that we had, but it was really uh, very satisfying. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably good just for showing how that session was laid out, and we can show this in full screen. Boom. All right, there should be some audio, but it doesn't sound like we're getting it, which is kind of a bummer. And I wonder if it's gonna play from somewhere else. Yeah, let's see. Uh, mm, I'm not hearing it. I wonder what's wrong. <laughs> uh, let's see. Speakers seems like the output I would pick. Um, I'm gonna pop this for a quick sec. Uh, maybe we'll try this one up here because I saw this working earlier. Mm, hey, it worked. Okay, sweet. Yeah. about sharing your space with a photo studio is they can make really beautiful videos like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, they knew exactly how to light it and exactly how to shoot it to really show like the architectural part of it off, you know, and the sort of more immersive part of it. Yeah, I mean, all in that project was, I feel like pretty standard in terms of like, there's a musician, we're doing visuals, I'm performing it live, reacting with her, learning the music, and then just presenting it, you know. Um, but we wanted to get into some projects where um, everything is more tied together, um, so that like the music and the sound are sort of like, and the lights are all tied. Yeah, this one is a little bit more integrated with all of our skills. So this is a project with Sonos that we just recently wrapped up over the past month and a half, two months. 
a series of two events. Um, there were a couple of different installations we made, but we're going to show you this one that we worked with uh, Holly Herndon, uh, a track from her new record, uh, Proto. Creepy. Uh, so we'd done a few um, volumetric LED pieces in the past. Uh, we're looking at a project that's one of the first, one, first projects that Gabe and I built uh, at a studio called a um, Ant Food in Brooklyn. Um, this was all very much by hand. We had no idea what the hell we were doing uh, when we did this. Um, and then we kind of moved up a couple of years later uh, when we started using touch, actually, uh, to do a much bigger version of something like this. This is in a luxury mall in Miami. This is a project we did, we did with uh, Snarkitecture and Perfection Electrics. Yes, yeah, so we had a little bit of experience designing for volumetric LED displays. Um, so when this project came along, they sort of just came to us and said, hey, we want to do a setup with a 3D light grid. Um, would you guys be able to help us figure out a design that uses yeah. that? Uh, so then we were like, yeah, and we'll make it even better than you could imagine. Yeah, so um, uh, because it's with Sonos, um, we had like the direct line in to like, let's do a pretty big array of loudspeakers. So we did 18 channels of speakers all around this volumetric LED array. So this is one of the first times we've been able to do a 3D sound project with like a 3D volumetric lighting piece as well. Um, this is a plan view of like the general uh, idea that we have for the room um, where we have, we try to fill the room as much as we can with light uh, within budget. And then um, like have the people come in this kind of bottom left area and be able to have kind of a hero view of the whole thing, but then also carve a path throughout the lights so that people can walk inside of it and be inside of the mix, uh, like the 3D audio mix that we did. Um, I'm gonna jump over and just show a little bit of our process in terms of doing the kind of physical side of, of design that ends up um, integrating right into touch. Um, but this is Rhino, uh, and then those of you that know it might know that there's Grasshopper, which is like a, also a component-based kind of visual coding um, plugin that sits on top of it. And what this allows us to do is like take the architectural information from the jobs, which usually ends up just like a PDF sent to you of like a plan, make a quick outline of the building, um, and start to think about how we want to design like the physical parts within that space. Um, and then because we can build everything parametrically, uh, I can start to have some control over like the density of the lighting grid. Uh, pretty quickly and easily, so we can start to like figure out visually what it is that we like. I mean, more pixels the better for sure. Uh, but then uh, reality kind of sets in too, which is budget and power and timing and all that kind of stuff. So um, we also end up rendering in like a lot of the calculations for how to build the projects directly in. So we can track uh, how many power supplies we're going to need, how much lighting we're going to need. So this is tracking like the fixtures, RGB channels universes uh, for DMX, um, how many short strands, how many long strands, and how long and short they are. And this really like makes the process much more efficient for us in terms of communicating with like the, uh, the lighting company that built this. Um, this was custom built. We had like different lengths made um, and a different resolution that you can normally get with these types of lights. Um, but also with the fabrication as well. So when we need to do the structure that holds all of this up, then I have like a living model of what that is. So if we make some changes last minute, we can update it pretty quickly. Um, we also end up exporting a bunch of this stuff out to touch. Uh, so I can write files just directly, I can stream directly to text files that we then read into um, the geometry in touch so that when we're doing the previs, again, if something changes four days before we're gonna do it, it's all updated and, and right. Build. Yeah, this yeah. is like the actual fabrication of the structure in the space. Um, we were working with one of the fabricator studios that we share our uh, space with. And yeah, they have like a crew of folks who help come in and then uh, rig all the stuff. Um, so yeah, it was a really awesome opportunity to just collaborate, um, work with everybody together to get this thing built. Yeah. You can see it going up. Uh, it's going up in that main space that we all share again. So being able to build this uh, in full was super helpful. Uh, it also helps out, and here's first light, which is always really fun. Yeah. Um, but it also helps out in terms of bringing the clients over so that clients can see stuff before they're on site too. Um, but the best part of it is being able to sit there and actually like animate with the thing that's right in front of you. 
Uh, we wanted to touch on um, just like the 3D panning methods that we end up using. So when we talk about having an 18 channel uh, array of loudspeakers around, we're not talking about the same signal going through all 18 of them, but individually driving each. And being able to take Holly's track and her session, which she sent us that has all the stems split out, and being able to start push them in different places and start to like make a 3D mix, not only from a levels perspective, but also from a movement perspective. So in this one, we were using VBAP, which is called vector, or which is vector-based amplitude panning. There's a whole bunch of different types. Um, and then here's like the one-line diagram uh, and kind of a simplified version of that uh, for anybody that's interested. So in this particular project, we're using Ableton Live. And then within Max for Live, we've, um, we've included a bunch of the EarCam SPAT tools, so just directly in Max or directly in live, whereas previously we had to ship out all of those tracks from live to a separate instance of Max, typically on a different computer. Um, but this was the first project that we got to do all that all within Ableton, which is really cool. Then we ship all the audio out over Dante, which is a networked audio protocol. Um, and then live is talking to touch, touch is talking to live. Yeah, totally. Um, so I think I should probably show the session. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and then we'll all sort of show kind of like how the whole thing got put together. Um, we, on the animation side of things, we worked with a guy named Nick Symbios, um, and he helped come with a really clever uh, fragment shader uh, pipeline to help deal with like rendering for 3D uh, lights, which is sort of like this thing that I feel like everyone's tried to do in their own way. Um, and they all have like strengths and and weaknesses and the ones that we've built over the years um, all work in different ways. Um, but this was sort of a clever one um, because it does use a fragment shader, but it's all like in a single, it's like a 1D fragment shader that's basically just making a sine distance field. Um, so yeah, I'll show you what's going on with that here. So this is, this is the grid of lights. Um, so we can sort of like fly around and see it from these different perspectives. Um, and what we're looking at right here is just one uh, sphere. So the sphere is uh, being calculated in this shader. So it's just one line of pixels uh, that's 2,500 pixels tall. Um, and what we're feeding that is uh, XYZ position. So this is basically giving you uh, a 1D like, shot of all of the, um, all of the coordinates. Um, just packed into RGB. Um, so then each of those uh, XYZ values then gets used for the distance calculation. Um, so in this case, like if the uh, coordinate, if the pixel is within side of the sphere, um, then it's going to get some sort of a brightness value. And sometimes there's like a fall off or whatever. Um, and then we have control over where that goes. So in this case, we've tied it directly into Ableton because we want to be controlling what's happening with the lights from the music session. Um, so that's sort of the magic of this project. It's that we're doing um, 3D light animation, but we're doing 3D sound mixing. Um, and the pipeline for the 3D sound mixing now is all in our Ableton session because of this new tool that we were able to build out. Um, so the black squares in this case are loudspeakers. Um, they're like input into the 3D mixing engine with their real world coordinates, their real world distances. Um, and then each of these green circles is a sound in the mix. So um, if I move this source position around, you can see that the um, green circle is kind of rotating. Um, so what that's going to do in the mixing engine here called SPAT, it's going to determine how loud that sound should come out of one of the speakers in the 3D array. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or a, or a series of speakers in the array, depending on which panning technique we're using. So you can. So with yeah. this tool, we can use uh, ambisonic panning. We can do VBAP, DBAP, nearest neighbor, all this, <coughs> all different kinds of stuff, and we can mix those as well. Um, so we do have in in the final Holly session, we had some ambisonic panning, like that's a little bit more blobby, a little bit less like specifically in a space. Uh, Amazonic kind of feels like the loudspeakers go away a little bit, which is kind of nice. And then sometimes with like the percussive stuff, you kind of want to know exactly where like the kick is coming from or where a snare is coming from or something like that. So 
we use a series of panning techniques um, within SPAT in Ableton. So um, because we know how to use OSC, we can do both at the same time, which is really cool. Um, so this is like, you know, your view of the lights over here. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, so this is the source here, and now we're able to move that, um, that distance field, the location of where the sphere gets drawn with this calculation. Um, and uh, if you have a whole bunch of sources, then it starts to get kind of interesting because you can sort of see all of them uh, jamming at once. So like I can map this azimuth here and turn on these LFOs. Um, and then you sort of have this whole visualization of where those sounds are in the 3D field. Um, so yeah, this was really exciting for us. I mean, we've been listening to 3D sounds now for a couple of years with our multi-channel projects, but we've never actually been able to like be inside of the thing and then also have like some light move past us that's totally mapped with where it's coming from. Um, so this is definitely a level up. Um, and then uh, the rest of the animation was really about just make, making it look freaking crazy. Uh, so it was sort of about like, all right, how hard can we push this? Um, so the rest of the effects that we played with were just about like, okay, cool, like, let's let's go nuts. Um, so in this case, there was like a uh, there's a plane. So this is like the um, SDF calculation for just like a single plane, and we can offset that plane um, in the grid, and we can also like rotate it with like other normal values. Let's see, yeah. Um, and uh, it was really fun to just sort of start sketching. Um, and some of the other like solutions for having lights be animated in 3D, maybe you're going to use like 3D textures or SOPs or something like that. Um, and the SOPs one usually is really slow, um, and it's hard to get like very resolute uh, designs. Um, but this this sort of like single dimensional texture solution came up with some pretty interesting. Uh, opportunities. So like if I have one just plain, one slice in the back here, I can copy that across and sort of make these stripes. So now every other slice here is, uh, is being lit up in the z-axis. And if we like sort of squeeze that down, this is like a scalar that's like squashed those stripes. Um, and then you can sort of like have two of those. So this is, uh, this is like two of those stripes to together on top of each other and offset. So like as I move this around, let's see, hey, yeah. These stripes are now like moving kind of like in between each other, like this zipper comb effect, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, uh, and then yeah, like you can feed that, for example, into uh, text 3D and cache those frames over time and then do lookups with uh, gradients across the grid. So this is like a, a X and a Z gradient across the whole system. Um, and in the same way that you'd use Time Machine in 2D with some sort of texture input, we have like a 3D gradient that we're using to look up across the uh, output as well. So this is like some of the cool effects that we sort of were surprised to find where you get these things that yeah. kind of like zoom out towards you in this pretty crazy way. Um, I don't know yeah, how. Always felt like yeah. a little bit constrained in the other two volumetric projects that we did that we couldn't really get. We didn't feel like we were really maximizing the pixels, and we felt like you know you could move like planes back and forth. I mean, I think partially that's a just a resolution thing of your system too, of like the physical lights. But in this project, we're both really happy with like the amount of shapes, the amount of like three dimensionality that we actually got across the lights. You'll see it. We'll show you a video here in a bit. Yeah, totally. Um, so the last problem with this whole thing was like we were going to mix this one song uh, called Eternal, um, which is a really cool track. Uh, it had been, I think, co-produced with a producer named Jalen. Mm -hmm. um, and we were given all of the stems, which is a really nice thing to have when you're doing a multi-channel mix. So all of these are... Uh, all these are the elements of the song from Holly. Yeah, and like uh, down there was the percussion, and like usually the percussion is all uh, baked down to like down. a stereo track, but they split all the percussion out for us. So we got we got to put everything, like all the different little 
like percussive sounds that you hear in this song that you hear in a bit. Um, we got to spatialize them all separately, which is super special. Uh, I think because I changed my uh, eighth inch cable, this might be a chase, but let's see. Let's see if we're getting into it here. I might switch this back to the other output. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, all right, let's see. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I feel like one of the themes of this year's Touch Designer Summit is like this timeline uh, problem that apparently we all have. <laughs> uh, so um, we sort of came up with our own uh, version, which is basically, let's just fucking use Ableton because it's right here. Um, and the great thing is that um, in the latest version of Ableton, Ableton 10, they really like beefed up the um, automation drawing system. So I don't know how many people have like played with the 10.1, uh, um, but you can do stuff now where like you can highlight an area, and then you can input like an S curve, for example, um, and then like you can grab that and like change how intense it is. Um, you can also do stuff where like uh, you can grab like I don't know. Let's say we put a saw down, and then I think you can like copy or duplicate that across, um, and then like if you grabbed all of those, so like oh baby, uh, yeah. So if you grab all those, then you can like skew them and scale them. Um, so stuff like that ended up becoming really handy in terms of making these uh, curves and motions for what the animations were going to do. Um, so if we move over here, I can pop up a little uh, visual window. Yeah, this will help. Yeah, so as I'm navigating the timeline, I have um, these TD Ableton objects. So uh, the TD Ableton stuff, if you have had a chance to play with it, there's some stuff that's really convenient and awesome about it because it's basically like an entire like uh, remote control for the entire Touch Designer session. Um, but the way it's doing that is under the hood using the Python scripts. Um, so it's handy, but it can be slow. Um, so Ivan knows this, um, and he's built certain tools that are just passing OSC through Max MSP. So this is like a TD Ableton object called the rack, um, and it basically is just a set of knobs that will pass OSC over uh, the local network. Um, so we just have a whole bank of those. Um, and we basically have one for every uh, animation effect. So all that stuff just kind of comes in here. So. This is the, the rack that controls the sphere object that we have in the scene. And this one is like a, per, a 3D Perlin noise thing that we can control. Um, and there's some global like brightness and feedback effects um, and angles and that sort of thing. Um, so in a way, like once you had it all set up, once, once we had all of these um, effects and then we had them all mapped to the knobs in Ableton, then I didn't really have to leave Ableton. I could just have... Um, touch animating over here with what I was sending, and then uh, I could just kind of jam. So um, you can see how like um, I can move through this timeline, and as I move through the timeline, it's changing the uh, the parameters on the animation curve. So like this is the Perlin noise one, for example. So there's like you know this speed variable here. Um, so like as I am like lower or whatever there, I think I can turn off this. Uh, for yeah so I can like sweep the the speed of the noise up and then you kind of like can get these ramps to happen in time with the music um, so yeah I can play a little bit of that for you here just so you can get a sense of what's going on um, so there's like uh, the intro of this is like this kind of tribal vocal thing uh, it's pretty crazy sounding um, Yeah. 
so it's been, it was really cool to sort of just start to script these things. And you can get really specific, you know, like you can really highlight every detail of what the song is doing um, just by sort of drawing it in. Um, so like there's this part, uh, hang on. Let me see if I can get this part to play back for y'all. Yeah. So this is like a pretty, like rhythmically specific part where you get these like highlights and all that. Um, so yeah, this was great. It was like, not only are we able to move the sounds around, because spat is moving as well. Uh, we're doing that 3D mix stuff. Um, so yeah, like one of these is the hi-hat. <laughs> it's freaking out. Um, and then some of them are just like the harmonies or the vocals moving around. Um, so like in certain cases, we're just basically like making crazy effects happen on the lights because it's more fun. Um, but in others, we actually are using the XYZ positions of the sounds to make the lights move and animate, um, which was like a really exciting combination of the two things. Um, yeah, and like the time machine lookup thing was so bizarre. You could get the craziest shapes out of that. Um, okay, cool. Uh, we can maybe play the documentation video. Uh, it looked like the playback from the browser was kind of chuggy, which was a bummer, but we can, we can give it, we're going to give it a go. And if it's um, chuggy and bad, it's not my fault, I swear. Okay, not yet. Not. Yes. There we go. Yeah. So this is like, at the beginning, the vocal is like moving around the grid out of the speakers. Um, so you hear it kind of flying around you. Yeah, and this is like in our studio. We added fog in the studio. Don't laugh. <laughs> Yeah, this was like um, a feedback. Um, it was just like a circle that was opening up in the front of the array, and then it was just like a translation in Z, so then it would just kind of like feed the trails back on itself. Yeah, thanks. All right, yeah, I think we still have a little bit of time. Did anybody see Vincent's talk yesterday? Yes. You did? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about creatures. We'll go through it a little bit quickly just to show you kind of the audio side of it, which by now you all know because it's similar to the previous stuff that we've shown you. But there's Vincent. He's the best. He's so dreamy. He's amazing. Uh, we spent two weeks of heaven with him here yeah. uh, in Montreal uh, in, at SAT, and it was super fun. That's right. Yeah, that, this was at SAT, which is, if you haven't been there, there's a, a massive dome uh, that, lucky for us, has 157 loudspeakers uh, as part of it also heaven. Um, this is how those are laid out. Uh, and it's not 157 distinct channels, it's 32 channels, including yeah, they, the sub. They grouped the speakers together into these like quadrants. Yeah, so we have 30, basically 31 channels of resolution, which is still really good. Um, and it ended up sounding super, super great in the dome. Um, and for the same reasons that we really enjoyed the Holly project, um, 
where the visuals are driving uh, the sound and vice versa, and you really get this like really coherent space that you're inside of where when you see a visual, you can also like map the sound onto that visual because the sound is being panned to that place. Um, so for those that are interested, this is um, kind of like the simplified line diagram of how we did this. This was before we had integrated all those SPAT tools into Ableton, so for this one, we had three different computers running. Uh, we had Vincent's touch machine, and then we had our Ableton Live machine, and then our Max and spatialization machine. Uh, and we were, everybody was talking to each other. Um, specifically, yeah. um, Vincent was sending us XYZ positions of all of the creatures. Um, so all those little swimmy teeth guys and the tentacles and everybody else. He was sending all of that directly to us, and then he was driving basically the SPAT engine directly. Uh, I think we have a little video of that here. Yeah, this is like just a quick uh, demo of his creatures. We're getting uh, coordinates from touch, um, and then we have those mapped to each of our sound sources. So each of the creatures would have a sound, and there was like some uh, modulations on them as well, based on like their speed and that kind of thing. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, we could actually like. You, you're in the dome, you're seeing the creatures move around, and then it's actually panning with the, with the motions. Um, and that happened in a few different ways. There was the, even a scene, uh, like the last scene uh, he had designed was with these like walking giants. And um, you know, you'd see a giant walking up on the distance and you'd hear it getting closer and closer to you. What you don't know is there was another giant walking behind you <laughs> until you hear like a massive footstep coming behind you and you look and there's this crazy giant up there. Yeah, and it's massive. Uh, it's and it's like, like really, 30 really feet fun. tall. Yeah, it was great. Um, yeah, and then the last project we wanted to mention yeah. uh, is a project called Push. We're good. Yeah, we're doing all right. Uh, this is a project we installed uh, at the end of last year in San Francisco. Uh, and this really kind of like shows uh, like the physicality in some of the work that we do, especially the interactive work. Um, we really like to get people's hands on things and to touch stuff and to be able to like, in this, in this particular project, we use stretched fabric. Um, but basically, like you as the user would walk in, and it, we, we got given kind of a weird space, honestly. It, um, they didn't tell us there was a column right in the middle of it for a, a long time on the job, uh, and a really low um, beam as well. So we ended up, like a, again, kind of responding to the space that we're designing in. Um, and you kind of walk up to the back of this project in a weird way that we ended up really liking in the end. Um, and then you kind of go around, um, it's these five panels. Uh, we stuck six loudspeakers behind each panel. Each one gets a stereo pair. Uh, and then we had connects that were looking at the, the fabric on the backside. And then you'd be kind of in this like weird little dark nook um, until you started to play with the piece and then the lighting would come up. We had uh, this kind of neon flex lighting all around the edge. Um, again, at our studio, we're prototyping, uh, drilled this thing into the floor and start playing with the fabric. We've worked with this fabric uh, a lot. We, we like this particular fabric. It's like 90% nylon, 10% spandex, and it feels really great. It's kind of gritty, um, and when you first start to push, yeah, I mean, this is, like, this is also like heaven, right? This is great. Um, but when you first start to push, um, you don't feel the tension as much, and then as you really get into it, and you can really, really put your whole body weight into it, then you can like, you just feel the physicality of the fabric in a really nice way, and then when that's, backed up with uh, a sound that's also um, being driven with like the tension that you're putting into the fabric and then the lighting is coming up as well, then it all comes together. We're also proud of this little detail. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with silicone edge uh, fabric stuff, but it's super clean, really nice. Um, and then this is kind of like the Han Solo uh, <laughs> shot on Trapped. the other side. Uh, simplified or line diagram. If you guys are interested, simple. This one was actually really simple. Yeah. Also, if you haven't noticed, get Dante for your audio. It's super, super good. It's Very audio simple. over the network. We talked about it last year, um, and if you didn't listen then, listen <laughs> now. Uh, and then this is kind of what it felt like. So each of these panels is a different voice in a composition that Gabe and I uh, made. We should also say we, we did the, the music and the composition for Creatures as well. Um, yeah, I was, sh I, I'll pull this up really quick. Okay. Um, yeah. Just because it, uh, it does kind of help show what happened. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so we really wanted to do water on the ground in front because there's like this area that you don't want people to walk because of the connect tracking and you're walking up to the back of the piece, which is kind of awkward. Um, but we really wanted to do water with vibration transducers under the water. So also as you push in and you get like the ripples in the water, like black painted uh, base for the water. So it's all reflective. Uh, but of course, the budget did not account for that. So we ended up with uh, these really nice river rocks that you saw there. Cool. All right, let's see. Did this load or did it fail? Come to me. Oh, it feels bad. This project also... Okay. Was, okay, yeah. Here we go. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I think this is working. Um, sweet. So, like we were saying, there was um, these five panels, and we're doing depth tracking on the fabric using five uh, Connect 1s. So that was handy because you can plug more than one Connect into a single computer. So we had um, two PCIe cards with like um, separate USB buses. So we could do all five Connects into one. Um, and then, yeah, we were basically just like getting the depth feeds um, into touch. And then um, sort of we're coming up with our own way of tracking like where people were pressing. Um, the blob track stuff can be a little finicky and slow. Um, I don't know if you've used it, like sometimes it's okay. Um, but in this case, like, all I really needed to know was what is the position of the deepest pixel. Um, and that's going to be like kind of where the point of their hand is on the depth map. Um, so uh, just like as a quick demo to show that, um, you know, we just have this little, uh, you know, whatever, this ramp. Um, so like the ramp will essentially uh, model the depth push. Um, so. This is our connect surface here. Um, and when you push in, um, we're driving Ableton. So uh, using the TD Ableton stuff for this project, it actually ended up being really handy. And uh, we didn't need it to be as crazy fast, necessarily. We were just sort of controlling the parameters of these synths um, in that way. Um, so as a quick example, like you can see here, we've got this. Uh, object, which is called the Ableton parameter object. And um, what that's able to do is you can see every single track that the Ableton session has. And then once you've chosen a track, it shows you all of the devices that are on that track. And then once you've picked a device, it shows you all of the parameters that are available to be mapped on that device. So it basically is just this like open book of every single knob in your entire session, which is totally crazy. Um, so in this case, uh, what we've done is we've mapped the y-axis of the um, fabric push to something that's strumming pitches. So, yeah, I think maybe if we can get a little more volume on that. Um. So, um, in Ableton, we have this little Max for Live object that um, basically we feed it a chord. So we say, hey, we want these pitches. And then it says, cool. And then it says, well, how many octaves of those pitches do you want? So it sort of multiplies it. So in this case, we've got five octaves of that chord. And then there's just a slider, which is sort of like your uh, pick on your harp. you know. Uh, and then uh, you can like move this single slider and then uh, strum pitches along that chord. So um, by feeding it new chords, you can sort of change the chord progression of the piece, and then everyone is able to play along with it. Um, but we were also using the depth, like how hard you were pushing in, to change some of the parameters of the synth itself. So we have this like little ARP Odyssey synth, and uh, just like a simple thing by changing the attack time can really change the, uh, the sound. So this is like a much slower attack, so the, um, the sound is softer. So that would happen like with a low uh, depth push, but with a uh, deeper depth push, you would make the attack snappier and uh, it would get a lot more plucky. So like if you just sort of lightly touched it, you'd get this like really soft like humming sound and then you could sort of like push harder and strum up and down and get these sharper ones. Um, and you know, like that sort of stuff is is endless. Like you can just sort of okay, like let's pick the uh, you know some other parameter and just go to town with it. So, yeah, I feel like um, if you have any interest in doing an interactive music project, um, the TD Ableton stuff 
little slower than you probably want it to be, but um, you can build something very quickly because it's all just available to you. Um, sweet. Uh, I think we have a little bit more time to show the last uh, yeah. experiment we've been doing, um, which is also very much like in this same vein of like, okay, let's have uh, touch designer make music and control sound. Um, and there was a group of people in, uh, in Spain, in Catalonia. Um, they're called Play Modes. It's a studio that we've like really looked up to for a while. They do really brilliant um, audiovisual stuff. They live in Catalonia in like the countryside. We it's were there, we visited. Incredible, yeah, we were there. Yeah, we were in Sonar with uh, Creatures. So Creatures went to Sonar. Uh, we needed to be in London a week later to install a project, so we called up Play Modes, and we were like, hey, we're gonna be in Spain for an extra week. You guys down? And they were like, come over. <laughs> uh, so they hosted us for a week, and we had a very, very nice, chill time in Catalonia. Yeah, um, we went to the beach. Look at that, pensive. Um, yep. The sky was beautiful. Um, and yeah, so their work, they had a piece at um, Day for Night, um, I guess, two years ago, um, the last one that happened. Um, and this one's called Cluster. Um, and it sort of shows like what they get up to, which is this uh, like light and sound projects in a very similar way like we do. Um, but their process for doing it is really fascinating because at the core of what they have is this um, modulation system. Um, so they wrote their own system in open frameworks called Ocean Node. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically, uh, like a node-based patching system where they have these banks of oscillators and then they can modulate the different banks of oscillators with themselves so they can like patch one oscillator into the phase of another oscillator, for example. And then by getting those modulation patterns, they then drive their reactor synths and then they also drive their LED uh, animations. And that was like sort of in a similar vein, a lot of the stuff that we've been doing, but we had never worked in that way. Um, so after... After having come back from Catalonia, um, we started to do some experiments. Um, so just wanted to quickly end with uh, the demonstration of that thing, um, which really is sort of this idea of, OK, how do we pluck sounds and make music with Touch Designer? Um, cool. This is hot off the press. Yeah. Uh, we were working breaks, on this up there I'm like sorry. half an hour ago. Um, <laughs> So yeah, let's show you how this is working. Um, so in this case, it's sort of like how David Braun was talking about phasing, right? So you can have a note get played, um, and then if you have a bank of notes, you can play them all at the same time, or you can use a phase offset and play them all slightly delayed from one another. Um, so that same concept is happening here, and that's what this ramp is showing. So um, as I move this slider, um, I'm basically shifting the phase offset of each of the pluckable notes. Um, so in this case, um, David's was sort of holding at one because his was always going from zero to one, but we're wrapping ours so that you can kind of get these um, looping patterns, um, which really helps to make these like really interesting um, uh, I don't know, rhythmic uh, relationships. So I'll just quickly play you like what it sounds like straight like this. Um, and then you can kind of tell what's going on. So um, the notes that are actually getting chosen and played is determined by this little <laughs> crappy interface keyboard. piano here. Um, so uh, we can do stuff where like uh, if we pick all these notes here, this would be um, a major scale. It's all the white keys on the piano. Um, and if we're uh, down here, this is like the key of C. So um, is it possible to get a little more audio juice on the output here? Uh, maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, OK, yeah, that's more pleasant. Sweet. So um, if we change the key, then um, we can start to hear this in like a different, well, we can change it like the octave. So like, like let's move up so we get higher pitches. Um, and then we're right now hearing it in the key of C, but we could move this up to like the key of F um, or the key of G as well. Um, and then by changing these relationships of the scale, you end up being able to sort of make the pitches either more major or minor. So I feel like 
this has been a really fun tool to play with because we've kind of gotten like this new uh, this new sequencer out of it. Um, I think the piano might even help us hear this a little bit easier. Yeah, there we go. Um, so here's like the Philip Glass like jam, I guess. Um, um, and by changing the input uh, or the uh, lookup shape, um, you get different durations. So this is just like a single like ramp output, but if you do sine waves, then you sort of get these like longer durations. Um, and then like logarithmic patterns either are more like really plucky or held. Um, so this one like kind of like sweeps down and then hits, and then the next one holds the notes down. You kind of like fall into place. Um, and then by shifting this, uh, this offset, then you get these like different relationships of the, of the melodic patterns. <laughs> Something yeah. that's been on our. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, if anybody has like a disc clavier or a player piano or something and you want to give it to us so we can drive it with this, that'd be really sick. Yeah, yeah, we'll make some Let black MIDI. Crazy Let stuff. us know. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so um, like we said, we, uh, we love having uh, friends from Touch Designer World come and hang out with us. I got to visit Tokyo and meet all the folks um, from the Touch Designer uh, study weekend. Uh, Yuki was an amazing host there. Um, and we just wanted to say, if you are in New York, um, definitely feel yeah, free to hit, hit us, us up, up um, and come by our studio, and uh, we'll show you the system and have a hang. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That was really, really inspiring. Um, does anybody have any questions? For Dave and Gabe. Hello. Hello. Hi. Not a question, but a suggestion. Uh, Amsterdam has this uh, Orgel Park. It's a park with four con MIDI controllable organs, and that would be the perfect place to oh, showcase man. your tool. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. That sounds Let's great. Go tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Check it out. Cool. Okay, I'll go down the middle. Hey guys, first of all, great work. It's awesome. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that you, in the SPAT engine, you can use a mix of different spatial techniques, like ambisonic and then the v, VDAP. Or yeah. Can you have both of those happening at the same time, or is it a hard switch from one to the next? Uh, in a single SPAT instance, you, could, you, only have to do, you can only have one, but you can either do multiple SPAT instances, which is a little bit dicey, or uh, we have two separate tools. Like we have a spat tool that can do whatever you want, and then we have a separate ambisonics tool, which is uh, the envelope, the, the set of envelope tools. I don't know if anybody knows envelope. It's a space in San Francisco for spatial audio, and it's like they're really well put together. Uh, and they made some uh, Ableton objects that are ambisonics specifically. Cool. And one other quick thing. Yeah. Um, do you guys have a convention or an approach to keeping track of what parameters you have mapped to each other in uh, your different softwares? Is there some sort of set of rules that you follow to make it easier? Because I've had terrible headaches in the past trying to remember which note in which track does what in touch and not labeling things <laughs> is a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, I definitely have found that the uh, the TD Ableton stuff helps you keep track of that in a really nice way. Um, so for the like automation uh, driving stuff from the Holly project, you know, it was just it was these eight or nine uh, TD Ableton racks, and they always know like who they're supposed to be talking to because it's like I'm this rack. Um, so I mean, if you open a different session, you'll have to kind of go and hunt and reconnect it. But if you open the same session, it always is just like locked in. So it's not necessarily like needing to hunt for uh, OSC addresses and stuff like that, um, which can get confusing. But I wouldn't say that we necessarily have like a, a template um, that we're working from. Yeah, it's usually like 
starting to figure it out along the way. Hi. Um, so I have a question uh, with regard to the, the last project you guys just showed. Um, I saw that you ha it was running at four, uh, 480 frame a second. Is there any particular reason why that project is uh, set oh, yeah. to that FPS? Yeah, I meant uh, to turn that off so no one would <laughs> see it. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was actually uh, Rui Gato last year has a, uh, presented a project called Geometrical Music, which I think spiritually is in a similar vein. And one of the things he, he noted was that he realized that if he had the um, frame rate at 480, that um, the, the sequencer wouldn't miss MIDI notes. Um, and I didn't have enough time to test, but I did notice that if it dropped below like a certain frame rate that I would miss um, like uh, triggers. So I was just like, well, Rui used 480, I'll use 480. And it's, it's worked pretty well. <laughs> yeah. All right, next question, please. Uh, so one of the things that I've noticed about working with computers is that it makes it sometimes uh, well, it's tempting to do all the work by yourself or want to. So I was wondering how you have come together for so long and what do you attribute your collaborative success to with this work? Oh, yeah. I guess that's just a personal thing in a way. Uh, We're pretty good at pulling each other out of holes. Like, yeah. we, like, Gabe does a lot more of the visual programming. I do a lot more of the, like, architectural design. We both cross over on a fair amount of stuff. But I think it's really easy to, like, dig a really deep hole for yourself and not know when you're done. And then, like, the project or what you're working on starts to actually get worse. And you start feeling worse. And if there's somebody there to be like, yo, that, you were there, like, two days ago. It was really sick. And, like, let's try this thing or let's try that thing or just, like, somebody else to help like that has some of the knowledge of, uh, of what the task is, um, but isn't like deep in it the same way that you are, I think that's helped us out a ton. Like Gabe has pulled me out of plenty of holes before. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also just a, a personal workflow thing. I think certain people, they work really well when they're just by themselves and they can kind of like blast through. Like our studio mate Bo, he will do everything. You know, he'll design the circuit port, he'll like design the structure, he'll code the shader, um, and it's, it's incredible. And he, I think, likes that because he doesn't feel like he has to check in with anybody else and he can just do the whole thing and just make it happen. Um, whereas like if Dave wasn't gonna say like, yo, where are you today? I might not go to the studio. Like I might stay home and like, you know, not make anything. Um, so I don't know, there's a little bit of like, like mutual responsibility that I feel like having a co-working partner has, you know, it's like with Dave and I, like I always feel like wow, Dave just brought it really hard, I gotta bring it really hard, you know? So there's like these feedback loops that I feel like we really play off of, which is really, really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, besides having enough space to iterate um, inside of your studio, what other elements do you think are necessary for a really effective, playful studio where you have enough um, structure to, to have everything you need, but also enough space to try new things? Yeah, totally. Um, Good question. Uh, I mean, our studio is reasonably, uh, like, there's a mix of disorganization and organization. Like, there's a bit of both. Um, but I think you definitely need some disorganization to keep the, just keep the vibe good. We have a lot of really great plants as well, that helps. Um, yeah, the plants have been nice. But, like, we, we're not hard and fast on when uh, somebody comes in to the studio. Uh, we trust that each other's going to get work done. I think everybody in our studio has that same trust, so we have like this mutual respect. Um, I think that's super important with any group. I think like um, sometimes it's hard, but uh, we're lucky enough where we have the lease on this whole space and the landlord isn't really around, so we sort of just, we make the rules, you know, it's like the kids are running the house in a way, so like no one's checking in, you know, and it, like we can be as weird and like messy or as responsible and clean yeah. as we want to be. Um, and I feel like that helps us really have a lot of like responsibility and ownership and like we can be chill when we want to and we yep. can be pro and like very client facing when we want to. 
Um, so I feel like you have to kind of like make that blend for yourself. And if you can, then when people come into your space, they're, they're sort of just wow. They're like, wow, I'm totally transported into your realm, you know? I think also opening it up in the way that we do shows, I mean, a lot of that is uh, personal for us because we want to be doing these way cooler shows that you can't really see anywhere else, even in New York. Um, but it's also really nice just to bring people into your studio and let them make stuff. And you kind of get surprised by things when people come in to do that. Yeah, Greg and I had the uh, <clears throat> very nice opportunity to visit you guys in your studio, and it yes. was super fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, come come hang. Oh, yeah. All mm. right. Oh, yeah. Okay, guys. Well, any more questions? or? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that. That feature. Oh, yeah, the wiggle. Uh, okay. Yeah, this was, this was supposed to be a big reveal. Anyway. Shit. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>